Good morning. Welcome to Unity Baptist Church. I'm Kevin Smith. We have a few announcements for you this morning. If you are a visitor, we'd like for you to fill out our Connect card. Send your bulletin in the back. It's a tear out. Um, you can leave it at the Welcome Center at the end of the service. We'd like a chance to get you to know you better. Golden Celebrities will meet Tuesday night, November 9th at 6.30 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. The Women's Ministry will have a bonfire on Saturday, November the 13th. For more information, please see Shayla Justin. On Sunday, November 14th, we'll have our Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Dedication. Please have your boxes packed and ready for the morning service. We have exceeded our goal of $2,500 for the Georgia Missions Fund. Thank you for those that gave to the Great Outreach Program. Any youth that would like to serve at Operation Christmas Child, please sign up in the youth room or see your bulletin for more details. We will have a church informational meeting Wednesday, November 17th at 6.30 p.m. Please make plans to attend the Harvest Supper on Sunday, November 21st. We'll have a great time fellowshipping, thanking the Lord for all of His blessings this year. We want to encourage everyone to attend Sunday School. We have a great time learning and fellowshipping with other believers. If you don't have a Sunday School class, we have the perfect one for you. And remember, if you want to be cool, come to Sunday School. everyone would stand. I'm going to pray and then we're going to start worship. Let's pray. Dear Father God, we give you thanks for this beautiful day where we could come and worship you, Father, just to spend time with you. And Father, as we already have in Sunday school, you reminded us through our lesson today that Abram was blessed beyond measure. He was credited righteousness because of his belief in you. And Father, that you rewarded him by having descendants as numerous as the stars. Father, but that didn't stop there. You do the same thing with us, Father, because of Jesus. And when we accept him as our Savior, Father, we have a reward that we could never pay for, a reward that we could never work or earn, Father, and that's a place with you in heaven one day. And we just thank you for that and just ask, Father, as we go through this time, we show our thankfulness to you, our love for you and our desire for you through song and word and father just may you speak to us in a very very special way the only the way that you can to each one of us individually father and continue to put on our hearts what it is you desire for us to do go with us now through this worship time we love you we praise you in jesus name amen
As we come before you not right now during this offering time, Father, it's our time to give back to you. You bless us in ways we can't imagine, richly bless us abund abundantly, more than we can even think or, or understand. And Father, you still tell us your grace is sufficient enough for us, but you still give more abundantly. And we thank you for that. And Father, as we go forward, as we pass these plates, Father, it's not just money, it's obedience. It's our act of faith to you, knowing that uh, as we give back to you, 
you've already given to us first and going to continue to give. And so, Father, we thank you for that. So now may you bless these tithes and these offerings. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Saturday was silent, surely it was through. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? Friday's disappointment, Sunday's empty too. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? is the sound of dry bones rattling. This is the praise, make a dead man walk again. Hope in the grave, I'm coming out, I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. Make a dead man walk again Children's Church, time to roll. I tell you what, after singing that, I feel like we need to do a little run and jump into shouting. Amen. Well, I guarantee you one thing, God ain't going to run out of miracles anytime soon. And I know of a miracle that he's wanting to bring in somebody's life here this morning. And that's the miracle of the salvation he's offered through Jesus Christ, his son. 
That's what it's all about. It's all about seeing people born into the kingdom of God. That's the reason that tomb, that, that stone was rolled away. So people uh, would understand that there's a risen Savior, a living Savior. If you got your Bibles this morning, and I hope you do, um, turn to Job. And we're going to be in the book of Job this morning, and we're going to be jumping around to a lot of Scripture. But I only want you to turn to one place, or two places actually, and that's uh, Job chapter 6 and then uh, Job chapter 9. We're going to read this together, then we're going to look at several different things in the book of Job, and then uh, that'll be on the screen. So Job chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, and uh, Job chapter 9. If you're physically able, I want to ask if you would to please stand in honor and reverence at the reading of God's holy, precious, inerrant, and fallible word. It tells us in the book of Job, chapter 6, verse 1, Then Job answered and said, Oh, that my grief were fully weighed, and my calamity laid with it on the scales. For then it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. And it tells us over in Job, chapter 9, verse 18, He will not allow me to catch my breath, but it fills me with bitterness. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you for who you are. And God, you are a way maker. You are the miracle worker. So today, Lord, as we are gathered together in your name and we're reading your word, I pray for your spirit to do your work. I pray, God, for salvation to come to those that are lost today. But Lord, I pray right now that people would simply be honest before themselves and before you. And Lord, if there's any bitterness in their life, that it would be chopped off today. God, you know what needs to take place in the hearts and lives of people. Lord, they put themselves in a position to hear your word today. And God, I pray it's preached. I pray that it is received. And I pray that you move. I ask you to anoint me and fill me with your spirit. God, my words mean absolutely nothing, but your words mean life and life more abundantly. So preach this message, Lord, through me. And we'll give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Now, I entitled this message, Chopping Off the Root of Bitterness Before It Chops Us Down. I preached a series one time, and it was called, You Can Be Bitter or You Can Become Better. Pretty original, right? But it was a good series. Uh, it talked about uh, forgiveness and unforgiveness. It talked about bitterness. So coming off of last week, and man, what a, what a last Sunday we had. If you weren't here last Sunday, praise God, we had a wonderful time. We, we, we looked at forgiveness and unforgiveness and how we are to forgive. And then we had a movie night, which if you weren't here at the movie night, you may not never have a movie night as long as I'm your pastor. I don't do that very often. I can only count on about, well, one hand, I think three or four times that I've had movie night. And guess what? I've shown the same movie every time. <laughs> Now, it's not that I despise movies or don't like movies. I watch uh, good movies all the time, Christian movies all the time. Uh, but I don't do it much because I believe it's about preaching God's Word when we come together. But I'm going to tell you, uh, that movie last week, Dealing with Forgiveness and Unforgiveness, it was right on point when we talked about that, uh, that morning. Well, even if you were not here last Sunday and you missed all that, you said, well, I just need to leave. No, you don't. Just stay right where you're at. We're going we're gonna to go right off of that, and we're going to talk about bitterness. Because here's the thing, if you will not forgive, if you will not come to a point in your life and make that choice to receive forgiveness and to give forgiveness, if you never get there, what you have in your life is bitterness. You're bitter. Oh, Brother Dudley, I'm not bitter. I, I, I don't act bitter. If you have unforgiveness in your heart, you are bitter, whether you know it or not. Job realized that. Not only Job, we see other people in the Bible. We're going to focus on Job, and we're going to look how we can get rid of bitterness this morning. I want to read some things here and uh, see what they have in common. Somebody has done you wrong. Your marriage partner has left you. You were fired unjustly from your job. You've had things said about you that was not true. You had or have a parent that has never spent any time with you. You've had a life-shattering tragedy in your family. You've had a bad experience in church. 
So as I read those things, and I, I guarantee you there's other things that we could, we could, uh, we could say or we could uh, come up with, but what is the following things that I just read, what do they have in common? Well, you may say some of these things I've experienced and some of them have stung very deeply, and you would be right. But there's something else that they have in common. These and other hurts like them are fertile ground for the development of bitterness. For bitterness to take root and for bitterness to grow. Bitterness can be defined as a hurt that becomes infected. There's a difference between a clean and a dirty wound. We live in this life and we all get wounds. Matter of fact, the first thing that a, a young boy is supposed to do when they get a pocket knife is cut themselves. Y'all know that, don't you? Right? I'm going to tell you what. If there is a young boy here that has never cut themselves with a pocket knife, I dare say they don't have a pocket knife. The first thing that a boy does, and a girl, if they get a pocket knife, is they cut themselves. They, that needs to happen. Now, the difference between cutting themselves and taking care of that wound uh, and not taking care of it, if you take care of it, it's going to get well. If you don't take care of it, it's going to get infected and it's going to lead to stuff down the road, possibly the, the uh, taking of that extremity or that limb. The dirty wound gets infected and you could get in trouble. But the clean wound is not. Bitterness is a lot like that. Bitterness, when it's treated, can be taken care of. Bitterness is also described as a root. It is described in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 and 15. It says this, Pursue peace with all people in holiness, without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up causes trouble. And by this, many will become defiled. Bitterness will destroy us. Bitterness will tear us down. It will take us out. So we need to get rid of it. Our example this morning is Job. Now, if anyone in the world had a right to be bitter, I believe Job would have a right. If anybody that we can think of in or out of the Bible, I mean, come on. Think about Job. He, lost, he had it all, then he lost it all. And man, it wasn't just fortune and, and fame. All of his children were murdered. He lost all of his kids. And then if that wasn't enough, he contracted a very painful and near fatal disease. And listen, if that wasn't enough, all he was left with was a nagging spouse who caused him grief and super spiritual friends who knew everything in the world. Yeah. So if anybody had a right to be bitter... Job would have had the right. Look again at Job as he writes here. In, in verse 6, he says, He answered and said, Oh, that my grief were fully weighed and my calamity laid on the scales. He said, For then it'd be heavier than the sand of the sea. Now, I'm not a mathematician. I, I'm not a very smart person. But I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I believe the sand of the sea would weigh a lot. Matter of fact, it's really immeasurable. And that's what Job is saying about his grief. And then he, he talks about the bitterness in 9, 18. He says that, that he cannot even catch his breath, but he's filled with bitterness. Are you bitter? This morning, I want you to, right now, hopefully you've already done this, but if you haven't, let's be honest with ourselves right now and ask God, ask the Holy Spirit right now, is there any root of bitterness in me? Now, I realize as I look across this room this morning that every one of us in here has experienced hurt in some way. But the question is, not if you experienced hurt, but are you bitter about it? Are you bitter? And if you are, is it directed towards God? Is it directed towards a spouse or a friend or a parent or a family member or maybe a church or a church member? You can be released from bitterness. You can be turned loose from bitterness. But in order to be set free, we have to chop off the root. We have to get rid of it before it chops us down. So there's some things that we need to understand about bitterness this morning. First of all, there are roots of bitterness. There are roots of bitterness. There are everyday things that we face that causes bitterness to, to simply take root. 
there are things that, that come along and fertilize us and waters that root of bitterness, and it causes it to grow. And as bitterness grows in our life, it chokes out the life of all that is good and decent in us. It chokes out the joy in our life. So if there are roots of bitterness. What people say about you can make you bitter. What people say about you can make you bitter. Job 12 verses 4 and 5 says this. He says, I am mocked by my Uh, I am mocked by his friends who called on God, and he answered him. The just and blameless who are ridiculed, a lamp is despised in the thought of one who is at ease. It is made ready for those whose feet slip. Job is saying, you say things about me that hurts, and you're kicking me while I'm down. Human nature is this. It's when we see somebody down, we keep on want to keep them down. We want to kick them while they're down. We want to keep them there. And Job is saying, that's what you're doing to me. He had three so-called friends that come along and were doing this to him. Now listen, Job had not asked these guys to come into his life. He certainly didn't ask them to give him some, any advice. He hadn't asked these guys to be his accountability partners. But upon seeing the tragedy in his life, they felt that it was their job to come along and to tell Job what was wrong and to set him straight verbally. We all have friends like that, right? We all have people like that in our lives. And what people say about us makes us bitter. Now, these three friends here would later get God's judgment. Believe me, it's coming. But what people say about us hurts. That old nursery rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me, is a lie. It's a bunch of junk. I would rather somebody take a stick and beat the tar out of me than I had to slander me. Because what people say about us will make us bitter. And I realize many of you have had things said about you as children that you remember today as adults. And that's the reason the Bible teaches us that the tongue is a very dangerous weapon. And we need to guard it. There's some things that's been said about you that you have never forgotten. And perhaps if you're honest with yourself this morning, you realize they've made you bitter. So there are roots of bitterness, and what people say about us make us bitter. But also what people think about us will make us bitter. Job says in 19.5, he says, If indeed you exalt yourselves against me and plead my disgrace against me. Job looks at his friends and says, Yeah, you think you're better than me. And you use my trouble as proof of my guilt. You see, these guys, they come along and say, Job, you got sin in your life. Listen, everything that that happens in our life is not because of sin. A lot of it is, but a lot of it isn't. And man, we don't need to come alongside somebody and start telling them what they're doing wrong in their life. When more so, what we need to do is come along and put our arms around them and love them. Correct them if they need correcting. But Job didn't need correcting. Job simply needed someone to sit with him. What people think about us can make us bitter. Job was saying, you think you know what I'm going through, but you don't. His friends lack perception at best and sensitivity at worst. We often say that we don't care what people think about us. Well, I don't care what people think about me. I'm going to say what I want to say. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And I don't care what nobody thinks. That's a lie as well. Because really and truly, we do care. It especially hurts when we're trying to please someone that we love. It especially hurts when we're trying to please someone and they reject and ignore us. And it tends to turn to bitterness. So what happens is, when this happens, there's a bitterness that takes root towards them and towards the situation, and and it begins to grow. Anything that's rooted starts to grow, and it becomes worse and worse if it's not chopped off. There are roots of bitterness. Also, what people do to us will make us bitter. It tells us in 1919, he says, all my close friends abhor me. 
Those whom I love have turned against me. The things that are done to us affect us greatly. Some of you have had terrible things done to you. I realize that as I prepare this message, I realize that we have a diverse group here this morning. Some of you have had things done to you as children and as adults that are horrible, that are terrible. And often what makes bitterness so painful is the fact that the ones we are mad at are the ones that we're really trying to love the most. And so it becomes bitterness in our hearts. It is not too often that we are resentful towards strangers after all. It's not too often that we get mad at strangers. That's the reason bitterness is so common in family settings. It's because it's people that we love, people that we want to please. Now, maybe you're here today and you have a parent that has abused you. A spouse that has rejected you. A family member that has taken advantage of you. A friend that manipulates you. You see, it is people that we care about that, the, that do the most harm in our lives, that cause us the most resentment in our lives. I believe the deepest resentment comes from situations that involve hurt from loved ones. And so the first step in chopping off the root of bitterness before it chops us down is realizing and acknowledging that there are roots of bitterness and where and how they come into our lives. Then there's the results of bitterness. With the roots of bitterness, there's always results of bitterness. What are the results? Well, bitterness is unreasonable. Job 5.2 says this, For wrath kills a foolish man, and envy slays a simple one. Some of you know that you're bitter. And you want to stay bitter. Say, so I don't want to hear this message this morning. I've already, I've already stopped my ears up. I've all, I'm only going to let so much penetrate my heart because I'm happy as a pig in, in slop, as a pig wallowing in a mud puddle, to hang on to my bitterness. Well, I'm going to tell you what the results of bitterness is if you want to hang on to it. It is unreasonable. Job tells us that to worry yourself to death with, with bitterness is a foolish thing to do. It says it's going to kill you. It kills a foolish man. Solomon tells us in Ecclesiastes 7, 9, Do not hasten in your spirit to be angry, for anger, anger results in the bosom of fools. It is foolish to hang on to bitterness and to harbor a grudge. You're not hurting anyone but yourself. There's no reasoning whatsoever when it comes to bitterness in the heart. First of all, it does not work. It simply does not work. It will never change the past. Listen to me. Some of you need to hear this. It will never change the past. Hanging on to your anger, hanging on to your unforgiveness, hanging on to your bitterness will never change what happened. I don't care how much you dwell on the situation. I don't care how often you come up with ways to get folks back. It simply will not change the past. It will never restore a relationship. There will always be a wedge if there's bitterness towards the person, no matter how hard you try. So it does not work. And it only makes it worse. Bitterness is so unreasonable that if left unchecked, it will only get worse and worse. It's like driving down the road and never taking your eyes off the rearview mirror. You're so busy looking at what's behind you, you're running into everything in the, in the front. And some of you are so bitter at your past. You're so angered at what has taken place in your life that you're wrecking your future because you're too busy looking in the past. And Job is saying, what Solomon is saying, get your eyes off the past. Quit being bitter and look towards the future. Bitterness is unreasonable. Bitterness is unhelpful. Job 18.4 says, You who tear yourself in anger, shall the earth be forsaken for you or shall the rock be removed from its place? Job is saying the only person that you're hurting here with your anger and bitterness is yourself. 
you're not hurting anybody else. Or you might be causing some ramifications in your family's life, but the person that you're angry and you're bitter at, you're not hurting them. You're only hurting yourself. It always hurts you more than the one who caused the resentment. And friends, it is emotional suicide. It is. The more you dwell and ponder on the problem without properly dealing with it, the more that bitterness builds in your soul, and the more that this happens, the more that you're taken down, not the other person, but you. So bitterness is unhelpful, and bitterness is unhealthy. It says in Job 21, 23 through 25, it says, One dies in his full strength, being holy at ease and secure. His pails are full of milk, and the marrow of his bones is moist. Another man dies in the bitterness of his soul, never having eaten with pleasure. I don't know about you, but that speaks to me. There's a man, two, two men, two people that were shown here, one that was not bitter and one that was. And it says the one with bitterness never even had a meal with pleasure. Now, I'll tell you, there's not too much in life I, I, left, I like to do. It's obviously not golf, Okay. I'm not getting any better at it, so I don't even enjoy it anymore. It's just, I just go. But I still like to eat, okay? I, I, I don't care. I was, I was at home yesterday, and I watched them dogs go dog. I watched them play yesterday, and man, I tried, I, I cooked me some stuff. I had, Sheila was gone, so I cooked stuff that I like. I'm not going to go in detail what it was, because uh, she might watch this later, or y'all probably tell her. Uh, so, but it was good, and it was pleasurable, Okay? I had a good time right by myself yesterday eating my food and watching my dogs. But what he's telling us here, if you got bitterness in your heart, if you got bitterness in your life, not even the meals that you take are with pleasure. You know, some people stay healthy until they die and they pass with ease and happiness. Others have no happiness and they die with bitter hearts. Bitterness will cause you to be unhealthy physically, mentally, and spiritually, it will totally and completely consume and destroy you. I was reading a book a few years ago, um, and I had a quote in there from Dr. S. McMillan. He's a doctor who lived many years ago, and he wrote a book entitled, None of These Diseases. And in the book, Dr. McMillan, he points out how destructive emotions such as bitterness can consume a person both physically and mentally. Concerning bitterness... He writes this, the moment I start hating a man, I become his slave. I can't enjoy my work anymore because he controls my thoughts. The man I hate hounds me everywhere I go. I cannot escape his tyrannical grasp on my mind. The man I hate is many miles from my bedroom, but crueler than any slave driver, he whips my thoughts into, into such a frenzy, my inner spring mattress becomes my rack of torture. I really must acknowledge the fact that I am a slave to every man on whom I pour my vials of wrath. I don't know about you, but when I read that, that grabbed a hold of me. Bitterness is like kudzu. Now, kudzu ain't the problem it was back in the 70s and 80s and even into the 90s. We finally found something that killed that stuff. Amen, Kemp? But it, for those of you that, had, that grew up around farming or grew up around owning land, kudzu would take over. It would cover. And there was nothing that would kill it for a long time. And if there's nothing that you could do, you could go and you could pull it up by the roots and you could eventually get rid of it. But left alone, it would cover. It would totally and eventually consume. Bitterness is like kudzu. Bitterness is like will make you like the lady who went to the doctor because she felt bad. The doctor did some tests, run some tests on her, come back and said that she had rabies. And so the lady, she pulled out a notebook out of her purse and got a pen and started writing down a bunch of stuff. And, and the doctor said, uh, thinking that she, that she was thinking it was more serious than anything, said, are you making out your will? She said, no, sir, I'm making out a list of people I want to bite. You see, the results of bitterness is unreasonable, it's unhelpful, and it's unhealthy. So we talked about the roots, of, of roots and results of bitterness. What we need to do now is examine the release of bitterness because that's where we need to get. 
We need to release it. How do we do that? How do we get to the release? How do we get rid of this bitterness that will eventually destroy us? Well, we got to be honest about our pain. Job 11, 7, 11, and Job 10, 1 says this. Therefore, I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. And verse 10, 1 says, my soul loathes my life. I will give free course to my complaint. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. We must be honest about our pain. Tell it to God. Tell it to the Lord. He's not surprised by your emotional state. As a matter of fact, he's waiting on you to come to him. He's waiting on you to get honest with yourself and with him and, 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 and come to him and, and say, Lord, I'm hurting here. I'm wrapped up in bitterness here. And I need help here. When it comes to hurt feelings and bitterness, we can do one of three things. We can repress it. That's what a whole lot of you are doing here today. You are repressing it. You're holding on to it. You're covering it up thinking that it's just going to go away. But it's not. And it's eating you alive. We can express it or retaliate. And the friends, it's not going to get you anywhere either. Or we can confess it. We can take it to the Lord. Someone told me the way they'd done this one time is they wrote a letter to God. I had another one tell me they, they typed out an email. Any way you want to do it. The good old-fashioned way on your hands and knees works good as well. Be honest about your pain. Free your offender. Listen to me. This is the hard part. Free your offender. Matthew chapter 5 verse 44 tells us this. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. We don't forgive because it's fair. I got a news flash for you. Life ain't fair. We don't forgive because it's fair. We forgive to be free. We forgive for our own benefit. And in order to be free, the Bible tells us that we have to forgive our offender. Friends, I'm sorry, it just doesn't work without that step. It just doesn't work without you coming to a point in your life and you realizing that bitterness is eating you up. Unforgiveness towards a person is keeping you down and you free your offender. And then place your focus elsewhere. Not only do you just get to a point where you're honest about your pain and you free your offender, but man, you've got to put your focus elsewhere. As long as you focus on the one thing that a person has done to you, that person controls your life or that hurt controls your life. Whatever gets your attention gets you. I was at Salem been there about three years, and man, we saw God just break out in revival, do some things in some church folks' life there. You know, when church people start getting saved, revival breaks out, amen? And so we saw church folks giving their life to Christ, being born again into the family of God. And man, there were two brothers there, two patriarchs. Both of them were in their late 70s. Two big men, physically, and financially, big men. Two brothers, close in age. But it, I come to find out about 35 years before that, there was a dispute over a little dog. A little dog got shot. One brother accused this brother of shooting his dog across the field. This brother said, no, I didn't shoot your dog. Well, from that, there was a feud. Oh, they still went to church together because that's what you did. You went to church. But this brother sat right here. And at Salem, there was a little side off, the, off to the sanctuary, the little side room. The other brother sat over there. As far away from each other in the sanctuary that you could get. Both of these men were deacons. Both of these men were uh, participating in the Lord's Supper. Both of these men, they, they heard the instructions. And they, they continued to, to um, partake of the Lord's Supper. And so... I got to a point as a young pastor, I said, this ain't right. I'm going to have to talk to him. And so before I went and talked to him, I began to pray, God, 
break these men. Break these men. Free these men from the bitterness and the anger and the unforgiveness that they won't let go of. I prayed that for two weeks leading up to the next Lord's Supper. And man, we get up there that morning, and I, I'm just, I said, well, you know, we get, it's going to do what it's going to do, Lord. Uh, you know, I never talked to him. But I've been praying to you, which, you know, it is what it is. And so, man, I'm praying. I go through the same scripture God put on my heart and having a time of self-examination. And so, man, I'm, I'm up here, you know, I'm, I'm doing self, you know, time of silence and everything. Got my head bowed, and I heard some movement. And so, you know, I, I think it's okay for the preacher to look every now and then, especially, when, you know, you never know what's going to happen. So uh, I kind of look up like this. And that old, old joker over here, the old man got up. And I seen him. Now, he had a bladder problem. And I said, well, he must be going to the bathroom. So I, I kind of watched him. And he got right over there where he'd go out the door, but he kept on past the door. He started toward his brother. And I'm up there, oh, my goodness, boy, if it would be a fight in the church. What am I going to do, Lord? How am I going to break them big old boys up? Man, they outweigh me by 100 pounds. And so I'm over here watching them. Corner of my eye, I'm watching and I'm praying. That one brother, he walked over to him. His other brother was sitting right there and he just stood there and he stuck his hand out. His other brother reached up and grabbed his hand. He stood up and they hugged one another. The release of bitterness was gone like that. It was gone. They ever resolve whoever shot their dog? No, I encourage them to never talk about it again. Because it did not matter. The bitterness was gone. Both of those brothers are, are gone and, and are with the Lord now. But before they left, they told me this. They spent 35 years apart from one another. Oh, they lived within a quarter of a mile. They went to the same church. But for 35 years, they had a broken relationship because of bitterness. You know, that's a... A story, it's a true story. But I wonder how many people in this sanctuary, it might not have been 35 years for you, but it could be six months or six years. But I wonder how many of you are dealing with the same thing that these two brothers. Job has given us three steps to, proper, to get this into proper focus. First of all, reach out to God. Ask him, tell him, Lord, help me. Get your heart right. Lord, I don't want this bitterness. I want it gone. And then face the world again with courage. The Lord blessed the last part of Job's life more than he did the first part. Now, that's hard to understand, I know. After losing all of his kids, losing everything that he had, God blessed him even more. The Bible tells us that. But he never could have blessed Job if Job would have held on to his bitterness. Job let it go. Be like Job. Let it go. You see, this can happen to us. God can bless us more now, more than we can even imagine, but we got to learn to deal with the hurt God's way and chop off the root of bitterness before it chops us down. You can be bitter or you can be better. You can choose to chop it off this morning. Would you do that? Pray with me. Father, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. God, I realize as I have preached this message, over the last three weeks, you've dealt with bitterness in my life. And Father, it's something that only a person, when they get honest with you and themselves, can handle. So Father, I pray this morning that you have your way in the lives of each and every person. And they would deal with this bitterness. It's not worth hanging on to. Father, it's my prayer this morning. If there's one here that's never asked you to save them, the day is the day of salvation. Lord, you, sent, you tell us if we simply believe in our heart and confess with our mouths, we will be saved. You've done the work, Jesus. You died on the cross. You arose from the grave. And you will save us. God, today, I pray you would move. We'll give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. If you're here this morning and you've never asked Jesus to save you, today's the day of salvation. Jesus died for you. He arose for you. That's the miracle that he offers. Oh, there's miracle healings. There's a miracle of all kind of things that we see God does, but it all 
brings you to one point in your life, and that's the salvation that he offers through his son, Jesus Christ. And the Bible says when you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you will be saved. Today, ask Jesus to come into your heart and to save you. Today, bitterness, get it out. Chop it off. Maybe you need to spend time at this altar this morning. I don't know what God's told you, what he's put on your heart. But I'll pray with you. Charlie will be down here with me. He'll pray with you. Whatever you need to do today, I want you to do it. I'm going to ask you to stand. And before we sing this hymn, or as we get ready to sing this hymn, I want you to think about what God is telling you to do and respond accordingly. Thank you.